Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Developer Bootcamp for week two, day four. I'm Bo from ChinaDE, and I will be the moderator today. For today, we are going to have speeches related to gamify marketing and tokenomics, and we also have a very special guest sharing some valuable thoughts about NFT and culture financialization. Our first speaker is Miss Blair. She is the CBO of the White Matrix. Blair, you may start whenever you're ready. Hey guys, it's Blair from White Matrix. I'm the director of incubation and investment department. I'm so glad to be here sharing with you some results of my recent thoughts and practices. Today, my topic is how blockchain gaming is taking the crypto ecosystem to the next level. GameFi is a recurring theme you can hear from anywhere. So, what is GameFi, and how will it impact gamers? In the traditional perspective, the time spent in this digital world is the wasted time. All the work spent building the strongest character,、uh, collecting the best items, or completing the hardest levels over and over, disappear once you leave the game. Now, what if that wasn't the case? You can keep what you build and sell it to others to making a real financial return.、Uh, this is what GameFi promised. GameFi sits under a new generation where digital economies don't just end when the game is shut off, thus blurring the boundary between in-game resources and、uh, real-world assets. First, I wanna talk about what is blockchain gaming.、Uh, you can see from the word GameFi. GameFi is the combination of game and finance. Runs on blockchain networks de-、uh, designed to merge the fun of games with the financialization of in-game economies.、Uh, distributed ledger technology is important not only to help players provide、uh, verifiable ownership of assets. But also to structure marketplaces for trading,、uh, both inside and outside the game. In this new type of game, all objects are represented as tokens on blockchain networks. So each sword, armor, or plot of land can be owned by you or anyone else on the blockchain-based game. In other words, every gamer within a blockchain-based game becomes both a participant and an owner. A recurring objective of game is to accumulate resources. Playing game allows you to accumulate more in-game currency, often present、uh, often represented as a fungible token or in-game assets like cloth, land, items. Uh, represented as a non-fungible tokens.、Uh, what's key here is once assets are earned, you can trade them on marketplaces for other cryptocurrencies or fiat money for disposable income. What is happening with GameFi is actually a continuation of a decades-long trend. The shift of power from game studios to the players. The first stage of game business model is pay-to-play model. Almost all early video games began with the same revenue model. Users paid money to play a game. The first game, like、uh, Pac-Man, let gamers play for a round or two before requiring more payment. Later games,、uh, playable on personal computers such as Call of Duty or, or World of Warcraft, sold a perpetual license for recurring subscriptions. While transactions were simple, users didn't have much influence、uh, in that period. The most notable improvement was simply more playing time in the form of content expansion packs. Then we move、uh, to the next stage, starting in the late 1990s. Free-to-play games removed paid barriers to entry. Players could download a product, start 
呃是 playing without having to pay upfront, and decide if they enjoyed it enough to spend money. Businesses made revenue from this model by advertisement or premium add-ons. One example of the latter came through selling customizable appearances, known as skins. Skins don't give the buyer any competitive advantage, but still undergo high demand from passionate fans. The game studio Riot Games, for example, famously became a multi-billion-dollar company on the back of selling skins. For their popular League of Legends, uh, franchise, note that uh, know the similarity. Uh, we 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 should know that the similarity between these skins and game fight NFTs. Game in this era are significantly more accessible. Players uh can try different games, select the ones they enjoyed, and make purchases to support their favorite developers. Power began to move slowly to the player side. Uh, so the low entry barriers set the stage for the first play-to-earn games. Back in the two thousands, a few play, uh, free-to-play games like Run Escape launched uh, uh, launched active marketplaces for in-game items. Uh, players would、uh, complete quests to earn gold, use the gold to purchase weapons or armor, and sell the items for real money to buyers who didn't do the same. Of course,、uh, during this era, such transactions were never protected by the law, tax agencies, or anybody else, for that matter. Gamers were able to build their own small digital economy in a、uh, <coughs> in a niche corner of the internet. So it is the history of the game. Next, I wanna talk about the token economy of the GameFi system. As I mentioned in the last slide. The game fight is not appearing from appearing from nowhere. The design philosophy of game fight system is rooted in and derived from the traditional gold farming of online games. Free market and gold farming has a long history in online games, but lost competitiveness to the professional players due to the lack of profitability and the hardship of operation. Gold farming is to obtain game resources and sell it to other players. This demand for game resources lies in the following scenarios. First one is that players are willing to pay for better game experience. Second is that with more players entering the game, the total demand for game resources would rise up. Game economy means the allocation and the circulation of game resources, including the output,、uh, transaction, accumulation, also consumption of game resource. The game resource output depends on some combination in capital, time, work, and randomness. The life cycle of each game resource are nested together, structuring a complex in-game economic model. So, play to earn is the results of the game producer handing over the right to produce game resources to players. In the closed、uh, traditional economy. The game producer can choose the output and transaction process of game resources, and they can profit from selling scarce game resources. But in an open economy, players can trade game resources so as to make profit through、uh, resource output. Ah,、uh, here is another core vision behind a、uh, play-to-earn. 
that is to address player retention issues by offering by offering real player ownership of in-game assets and their surrounding world, ultimately creating greater stickness and the retention of communities. In contrast to the current global uh, 30-day retention rate of 3% of mobile games, we have seen some initial success with the first prominent play-to-earn uh, ecosystem. Uh, taking Axie Infinity as an example, which has a uh, day zero to day 90 retention rate of 40 percent, which is significant, uh, which is significantly higher than the traditional uh, games. Uh, economic sustainability and the growth occur when the value flowing into a system is greater than the value leaving it. In game design, the mechanisms influencing value flows in an ecosystem are uh, sinks and, uh, uh, and uh, faucets. Sinks take supplies of an asset out of an economy. For example, SLP burns uh, through Axie breeding fees. Breeding is incentivized in general to build stronger teams and obtain higher rewards and uh, faucets inject uh, asset supply into an, uh, into an economy. For example, SLP earned by completing quests or battles. For economies to be sustainable, the sinks need to take more of the token supply out of the economy than the faucets uh, that bring the token into the system. Otherwise, there will be natural downward press pressure as supply increases over time. To balance the rate of asset issuance with the rate of asset consumption or demand, it has a couple of options, of course. First one is uh, you, can continuous, uh, you can continuously grow the rate of growth of new users to allow older players to sell to newer players. Second one is to continuously introduce newer, harder, and more resource-intensive endgame content for existing players to expand more resources. The last one is to balance the creation of gold and items with the remo removal of set, uh, set gold and items from the game. If this balance is mismanaged, the player experience and the retention will suffer. So, before we dive into the economic model design, we should break the complex ecosystem into basic components first and uh, make, uh, make clear the definition of each component. A mature GameFi e economic system is always composed of three elements, that is DeFi, NFT, and uh, FT. First one, we talk about uh, DeFi. DeFi, or decentralized finance, is a system by which financial products become available on a public decentralized blockchain network that makes them open to anyone to use, rather than going through middlemen like banks or brokerage. Uh, brokerage. Uh, refers to GameFi project. DeFi aims to enhance the profitability of investors and seek the maximum funds that participates in blockchain games by a large portion to facilitate the player sales and rent their game assets or stake their coins in the pool as a, liqui uh, as a uh, liquidity provider. Even lacking of the playability of a game, DeFi utilization attracts players related to crypto investment and a variety of casual games are derived. Nonetheless, uh, decentralization is the biggest difference between GameFi and uh, traditional games. 
in traditional games, uh, the game producer or game designer often acts as god. Uh, acts as god, not only designing the storyline for the player to experience the game, but also acting as the central bank for releasing and recycling the game's resources. Traditional games can control game resources in time to prevent economic collapse and prolong the game operation period because of the powerful centralized means. But game companies deprive players of ownership of their assets, and it is not uncommon for traditional game companies to deactivate accounts or shut down the servers as uh, well. The second one is NFT. NFT is also named non-fungible tokens. Uh, NFT digital assets uh, represents real-world objects like art, music, and videos. They are bought and sold online, frequently within cryptocurrency, and they are generally encoded with the same underlying protocols as many crypto assets. Majority of in-game NFTs are game items that included uh, interactivity NFTs and uh, collectible NFTs. Interactivity NFTs can be applied in the combat and advanced, trained, merged, also casted, uh, inherited, uh, such as incubator, sprite, uh, card, avatar, being advanced, trained, and inherited to reinforce the player's in-game performance. Uh, collectible NFTs uh, function out uh, function out of the gameplay that is involved in recreational scenarios and uh, limited combat attributes enhance the pleasure of players uh, possession like uh, land plot skin cosmetic and uh, badges. Comparing with common NFTs, the in-game NFTs has the potential to be interoper uh, interoperable. Some gaming platforms uh, have already achieved avatar interoperability, and uh, some games cooperate to convert the non-fungible attributes to one another. Though certain gaming pioneers uh, envision the interoperability of cross-game and cross-chain NFTs, there are still some uh, implementation problems on the blockchain technology and the flow experience of video game at the present. The last uh, basic element is FT. FT uh, is fungible token. Fungible token in GameFi projects generally refers to the game currency used to define the value of the underlying resources in the game. Making the in-game economy possible, currency, players, uh, resources, and goods together for uh, together form an eco uh, economy in which each element is linked to one another. Players maximize their own interest in the gaming process, thus the value of currency controls a player's behaviors, determining what the player makes and for whom. In-game currency plays a role as a lever that regulates economic behavior, throughout the game, links different elements into one and uh, coordinates the benefit uh, and profit of players. Now we are ready to move to the next topic, how to design a sustainable GameFi economic model. 
game resource and uh, currency mentioned above are the funda uh, foundation of the in-game economy, but it still needs an adjustment system to balance the supply and the consumption. The game itself evolves complex, uh, complexly numerical relation. In the real world, the demand for a commodity may be uh, saturated in the short term, but the demand uh, for commodities is infinite in the long term, because commodities in the physical world will always be consumed over time. On the contrary, the game item can become worthless when there is no demand because the value of game resources uh, come from player interaction and in-game consumption. There are scarce uh, currencies and resources, and there are infinite resources. So not having a good relationship between consumption and the output in the game world is a re uh, recipe of, uh, for economic collapse. The, uh, the economy of the game will inevitably collapse if the relation between consumption and output is not established in the game world. Uh, here are some useful tips tested by the traditional games. Uh, I want to share with you guys to see if it can help you to build your own game file, uh, to build your own games. Uh, number uh, solution number one is to design more assets, mechanism, and scenario to let players spend in-game currency. Here are three ways uh, to to construct such scenario. First one is the utilities. You can charge players for small quality of life upgrade upgrades or for the use of public goods as a token sink. This taps into a player's desire for accomplishment and uh, his desire to avoid unnecessary time expenditure. Uh, uh, here are some examples. For example, a uh, flight path for faster travel and uh, armor repair. Notably, this uh, replicated real-life depreciation cost. And the next one is tolls for uh, accessing areas, including instance, um, instance uh, uh, instant dun uh, dungeon cost. Uh, and next one is salons to change your appearance or name, and also the ability to pay to uh, reset your states or skill trees. And the last one is to buying and uh, decorating houses. And the uh, next way is the rare collectibles. You can peer, uh, periodically auction or sell rare collectibles uh, in in-game currency. This can be done consistently through a luxury merchant NPC as part of a special event or as a gambling game. This is driven by a player's desire for social influence and ownership. And also, you can use gambles. Gambling games are designed uh, to have a negative monetary expected value, but players are incentivized to play because this is the only way to obtain rare cos uh, cosmetics. It's an easy way to obtain extremely rare items, or it's fun. Uh, each, time <coughs> each time a player participates, uh, they must pay in the native token. Because expected payout is negative, this is a token sync. This is driven by the player's desire for ownership. Uh, solution number two is to charge fees on transactions. Levy taxes on auction houses, marketplaces, 
person-to-person -person trades and on the possession of land or houses. This requires first uh, for the game creators to control a marketplace. Transaction taxes have historically been the largest sink for ISK for the past two years. The broker's fee comes at a, at a close third. In a game where trade becomes a larger portion of gameplay in a later stage, most MMOs would fall under this category, adding a heavy transaction tax effectively takes currency out of the oldest and richest player's wallet. Taking uh, currency out of the game where it is the most abandoned while preserving holdings of new players going through the onboarding process. Taxes is very effective. Tax marketplaces, trade and uh, idle resources, and uh, use tax revenue for additional burning or community-oriented activities. The solution number two is crafting. Crafting can act as both an item and a currency sink. Players use lower-level items to create higher-tier items, consumables or cosmetics, which consume component items and at, at times in-game currency. This is driven by a player's desire for mastery, curiosity in discovering new items and experiences, and creativity in finding new combinations. Crafting an item sink only works if the item being produced via crafting is not widely available in the marketplace or by other means. If an item is obtainable through methods that take less time and money than crafting, or players can easily buy up, uh, can buy up raw materials then sell the crafted product for a profit, this system may end up generating even more gold in the system. The last solution is uh, solution number four. Unlock more game content. Instead of requiring fiat to purchase additional game content, membership, or DLCs, sell it for a large amount of in-game currency to players. The quality of content and the player experience will be the key driver in affecting the player's desire for unpredictable uh, for unpredictability and curiosity and accomplishment uh, and uh, enticing them uh, to purchase additional content with in-game currency. In the previous section, we explored balancing solutions tried and tested by the traditional games and for Web3 games uh, come with multiple additional opportunities to produce uh, organic syncs and balancing mechanisms. I will introduce you here. Uh, solution number one is seed mods and forks as token sync. Uh, because Web3 games can monetize through secondary sales and taxes on core infrastructure and thus benefit from the expansion of the entire game ecosystem, they have strong incentives uh, to seed new mods and player creations, which in return creates organic demand for their ecosystem tokens. This is a natural uh, counterforce to the innovator's dilemma and uh, can create ever-evolving and uh, thereby longer-lasting games. <coughs> this is the strategy taken by Sandbox of Gochi and uh, Sky Mavis. Mavis. Uh, the core team in all three cases have build infrastructure, deep liquidity, and an initial ownership base. Next, 
they encourage ecosystem enterpre-、uh, entrepreneurs to build mods and、uh, sub games atop their platform and、uh, collect revenue in the form of an acti-、uh, activity tax. This is why Axie is branding itself as a nation. The holders of the AX、uh, AXS token are the government that receives tax revenues. The inventors and builders of the game Sky Mavis uh hold uh, about twenty percent of all Axie tokens. Second example is Evgochi. Evgochi mini games are community developed games that are playable only by those who have an Evgochi. Uh, because each game is different. Of gochis with different traits and、uh, beneficials for different games. In many cases, an of gochi that has a lower base rarity score performs better than one with a higher rarity score in certain mini games, create ah、uh, which creating demands for a wide ah、uh, for a wide variety of of gochis. For Designated a period of time, playing the mini game can also earn you XP, giving you a higher chance of winning a leaderboard ghost prize. Ah,、uh, so in order to use these strategies above, games have to decentralize, ah,、uh, while incentivizing talent building on the platform. They have to also allow modders and、uh, ecosystem developers to take a cut of the、uh, economic output they create,、uh, maybe through royalties and、uh, contribution correlated rewards. And、uh, solution number two here <coughs> is to build and own critical infrastructure and、uh, collect fees as sinks. Uh, this is actually an in、uh, extension of taxes from previous page. Play to earn games、uh, can build, govern, and、uh, monetize through owning core infrastructure, and、uh, levying taxes on the usage of core infrastructure. <coughs> Sky ma、uh, Sky. Mavis owns its own chain, marketplace, and DEX, and charges a gas cost and a marketplace fee to use these protocols. These protocols all generate fees, which can then conduct buyback and burn, where taxes can be directly burned as well. It is arguable much easier for a play-to-earn game studio to develop. Uh, to develop a、uh, protocol's infrastructure, then try to、uh, inorganically bootstrap a、uh, ecosystem of games. Uh, if a、uh, play-to-earn economies、uh, protocols, then the more protocol scope and the coverage they can cover, the more value ac-、uh, accrue can emerge. Uh, but in an open source project and in the long term. High take rates are likely unsustainable. Only if the play-to-earn game delivers the highest quality core infrastructure, uh, incentivizes the best operators to contribute to their infrastructure over building their own, can they justify critical infrastructure as a token sink? Or as a large revenue source of their treasury operation. So we come to the last page of today's topic. Ah,、uh, it is from play to earn to play and earn. A balance of faucets and sinks is required to maintain a healthy equilibrium of prices within a virtual economy. We have known that. However, a sink never guarantees that any game economy token will regain its all-time highs. In fact, sinks only work if people use them. 
Web2 gain benefit from the fact that they are closed economies where once money enters, it is difficult for it to leave. No in-game currency to USD exchange that is easy, transparent, and legal. This means uh, they also benefit from a larger degree of separation of their currency from fiat in the minds of players. This means players have no choice, uh, no choice but to spend their money inside the platform or game, and uh, players are, are less likely to conduct highly mathematical calculation in returns when engaging in any activity and are therefore more likely to use currency for random things or just for fun. A uh, play-to-game uh, does not enjoy these benefits. To encourage uh, players to participate in things in an environment where the USD value of your inputs and outputs ex uh, is ex uh, extremely visible, it must offer either additional currency for burning, which further increases its supply, or some other form of additional utility. And thus, uh, in an open economy, only if the following equation holds will things be effective. That is, uh, the fun players get from the game plus the utility from using things is greater than the cost of using a sink. What determines the uh, efficacy of the sink is whether people use it, and people will only use it if they see value in doing so. So ultimately, we can, we can make a guess that people need to be spending for fun, status, uh, convenience, flexing for the economics to work permanently. That is all I want to share to you guys today, and I uh, hope you get some knowledge. Thank you for the talk, Blair. Um, let's move on the next speaker, Benjamin and Kawami. Benjamin is the founder of uh, Jenny Metaverse DAO, and Kawami is the co-founder and chairman of Savannah. You guys may start whenever you're ready. Good morning, good day, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Kwame Rugonda, and I'll be presenting today on the Metaverse, uh, Blockchain Games and DAOs on the Binance Smart Chain. And I'll also go into a little more detail specifically on how we as a company made it to number one. I'll save the rest of that detail for the presentation. Uh, my name is Kwame Rugonda, like I mentioned, and I run a company called Savannah. Savannah is an African technology company, and we incubate blockchain companies. Among the companies that we have incubated on the continent include Crypto Savannah, which is a blockchain dev shop, Binusu, an OTC desk, and Tuzanye, which is now the most productive gaming guild in Africa. Personally, I also are the chair of the Blockchain Association of Uganda and was the co-founder of Binance, Binance in Uganda, when Binance set up in 2018. I was a local partner and co-founder, and I uh, have served on the World Economic Forum Council of Cryptocurrencies. So I've been involved with the crypto space and crypto in Africa for quite a few years now. I'll start by speaking briefly about the metaverse, and then I'll move on briefly to speak about DAOs and then finally blockchain gaming. And I'll use these few minutes just to give an overview. Um, starting with the metaverse, the metaverse essentially is a 3D universe combining virtual aspects that are used for various opportunities, including gaming, including works, including meetings, including socialization. And what we are seeing of the metaverse today is just in its early stages. But we are already seeing elements of it being manifested in things like video gaming, uh, virtual economies, and so on. The metaverse is particularly unique because it has attributes, and its attributes enable things like proof of ownership, transfer of value, and governance, which are all very critical in the fusion, the ongoing global fusion that we are seeing between the financial, virtual, and physical worlds. 
I'll talk briefly about DAOs and um, covering these at a high level because um, I want to focus a little bit more on blockchain gaming. And I also are familiar, and I know that many of the team here are familiar with what these aspects already are. So DAOs are decentralized autonomous organizations and they are run and governed essentially by software, by computer code, and they can function without any form of human intervention or without any form of central authority. So they are, they are autonomous and they're decentralized. They do not require a central authority. Govern, uh, DAOs are really disrupting the way existing hierarchical, hierarchical structures of governance in society operate. And these range from the way countries are run with governments to the way our own companies and organizations are run. So DAOs are presenting an entirely new, an entirely new form of governance. And it's actually operated by a community of stakeholders that have incentivization through a token mechanism. There are various types of DAOs. Um, there are media DAOs, there are service DAOs, <clears throat> investment collector DAOs, and some of them are the ones um, in front of us. Now, I want to circle and move towards uh, blockchain gaming because this is where I want to focus um, most of my presentation. Over the last few years, maybe last two years or so, we have seen an explosion of blockchain games. And this is a very early application of the metaverse that is already providing real income opportunities for many people. The story of Axie that um, became headlines last year drew attention to blockchain gaming, particularly because of its impact in Philippines around uh, COVID times. A lot of people had lost jobs, were at home, and Axie was able to bridge the income gap and enable people to earn incomes. And this featured quite extensively globally, and it drew a lot of attention to blockchain gaming and P2E. And now we are seeing many other games that are beginning to emerge. And this industry of blockchain gaming is really at the cusp of explosion. Blockchain gaming, particularly in Africa, is one of the fastest growing industries. And like I mentioned earlier, we are, we are really at the brink of witnessing an explosion of P2E, and especially P2E in Africa. And I will highlight just three factors that contribute to this. The first is that Africa is the youngest continent and the fastest growing continent. The youth population in Africa is estimated at about 60%. 60% of the continent is under the age of 25. Where I am currently, as I give this presentation, Uganda has a population of about 80% under the age of 30 and 50% under the age of 15. So this actually means that not only is the continent young, but the continent is going to be persistently young for many more years going forward. And there is high fertility, meaning many children are born. There is low infant mortality, many um, significantly less number of children are dying at a younger age. And so therefore what we are seeing is going to be a persistent situation of a very young population. And on top of that, it's rapidly growing. Um, 15 of the fastest growing cities in the world are in Africa. So that is a key demographic component for what makes Africa attractive. Another one is the very high unemployment rate. It is estimated by the African Development Bank that youth unemployment in Africa is at about 33%. In some countries, it goes all the way up to 60%. So the high youth unemployment coupled with a young population make Africa hot for P2E. But then it's a third factor as well that I'd like to talk about, the rapid internet penetration. We are seeing an upsurge of internet, especially on phones. Because with smartphone adoption, which is currently at about 50%, we're seeing an upsurge in internet penetration. So this unique series of factors are making, are making Africa particularly attractive for P2E. And they, I mean, you have millions of, the, on, on, of, of young people on the continent now, they're spending time on devices. <clears throat> I want to speak about Tuzanye, which is a company that we are um, privileged to be a part of. And my shirt actually has the logo of our company Tuzanye. It was born in 2021. And it is a word that means let us play in one of the local languages in Uganda. And so Tuzanye is a global P2E community with players 
uh, currently maximizing their performance and borrowing NFT assets across the universe. It is run and structured through a DAO. It is managed by a DAO um, comprising uh, the TGT token holders and our players. And Tuzanye is currently the most productive gaming guild in Africa and will be improving thousands of lives in this next year, 2022. We took some time to study several guilds and we said, what is it that we can do distinctly different? And so we modeled our guild uniquely different and this is what has caused us to be extremely productive. We are currently ranked number one in Starshucks, Binance's recently backed game. We were ranked number three in January and as of February, we are ranked number one. And so what I'd like to speak about is what are we doing at Tuzanye? What are we doing at Tuzanye that is different? That has caused us to be able to uh, perform extremely well. <clears throat> the first is these um, other attributes that I'd mentioned earlier, the social structure in Africa, youngest continent, fastest growing population, fastest growing continent in terms of development, extremely high unemployment and rapid internet penetration. These factors combined together put the African society um, in a unique place in terms of attracting P2E opportunities. The second is that the way our guild is structured is that we have esports players. And so our guild is actually structured as an esports team. And this is different from the structure of many other guilds. And this ensures optimal performance of team members. It is supported by a head coach who's actually a former professional esports champion. And he works with a team of trainers. And this ensures that we can bring both to our guild to Zanye. Uh, top talent globally in esports and regular support by these coaches. So our head coach, um, Alex, is a professional esports champion. And then we have trainers who um, have been amongst the best that we have found in Uganda. We also play a series of games. <clears throat> the fact that we have this experience with esports enables us to identify the best games. And so we are playing several games. We're playing Axie, we're playing Gods Unchained, we're playing Splinterlands, Rift Racing, but it's Starshucks that we have been playing most aggressively recently and are doing uh, extremely well. <clears throat> our teams are actually trained um, by our trainers and they are trained in, in, in settings of <clears throat> like the one that you see in this image. Uh, we have the trainers spend a lot of time with them and this ensures that they have thorough understanding of the games, but it also provides peer-to-peer -peer support. In other words, any time that I want to see what my colleague is doing, or if I'm not understanding something very well, I can just be able to look over into my um, my, 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 my colleagues or my partner's skill set and then be able to tap from that. This is a very, very good thing because it brings a unique team dynamic. And speaking of team dynamic, the team begins to work together. And this team dynamic is part of the reason for which the teams are doing exceptionally well. And in some of these images, you can be able to see one of our teams that is seated together in, 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 in their sessions. And they work together like this. Uh, they work from eight to five every day. And we're able to provide incomes for uh, you know, hundreds of people like this. One of the other factors that has led to the success of Tuzanye is partnerships. And this is probably the most critical factor at this stage. There are several other factors that I mentioned about the esports setup, about the teams working together, um, about the African social structure are all very, very good. But partnerships has been um, really the underlying factor. And partnerships, as we all know, can go a, you know, a very long way. Just last week, speaking of partnerships, we signed up. Um, we were privileged to have uh, two advisors join our team, uh, Peter Ng from Blockchain Space, as well as Sebastian, uh, the co-founder of Sandbox. And through partnerships, we've been able to <clears throat> do a lot. These partnerships have brought you know, three uh, critical aspects of value. The first is a deep knowledge of Africa um, and Africa's crypto space. I and the team in, in, in Tuzanye have been involved with Africa's crypto space for the last four or five years. And so we know Africa pretty well, and we also know crypto in Africa pretty well. The other great uh, component is gaming. I mentioned to you that we, we, we're bringing esports players globally. 
And this brings the history and the experience of gaming. And then finally, uh, crypto and NFTs. So not only ourselves, but we're working with a series of other partners um, <clears throat> from Jenny Dow that, uh, that we see here, as well as uh, Prometheus Labs. So this is the partnerships that have been able to bring great value to the work that we're doing at Tuzania. Now, that is on the point of the experience through partnerships. Still through partnerships, we're being, we're, we're able to build a creator economy. And this is what we have work, we're focusing on now. We're building a creator economy in the sandbox. And this will bring Africa's rich cultural heritage into the metaverse. And it's the first guild, Tuzania is the first guild to launch a creator economy in the sandbox. Um, <clears throat> and that is a, you know, one of the most profound things that we have been able to sign up recently. Uh, thirdly, we are concluding our private round with top investors from around the world and industry leaders as we prepare to scale across Africa. <clears throat> Fourthly, through these partnerships, we believe that we have a unique opportunity to be able to create UBI, universal basic income for millions of people. What, what Play to Earn is doing is that it is enabling us put significantly greater resources into the pockets of young people on the continent. So there is higher revenue earning, but there's also higher social value because these people's lives are able to be improved. And so, <clears throat> as to say, we're doing well, and we're we are really glad and we're really privileged to be able to be doing well. But really, we have just begun, and we have a long journey ahead of us. This industry that we're in, that's at the convergence of crypto and gaming, is one that we're just scratching the surface of. There's so much more that can be achieved, and like I mentioned at the beginning, we're just at the cusp, we're just starting in this new industry of crypto gaming, of blockchain gaming. And we really believe at Tuzania that this could be one of the greatest opportunities of our lifetime. Um, we'll hold our public sale. We are currently, I mentioned earlier that we are wrapping up our private sale. And we'll hold our public sale at the end of March. And we we'll invite all of you to, to join us and to partner with us as we unlock the great opportunity uh, that blockchain gaming enables in the world. I thank you. Well, thank you for the sharing, gentlemen. Our last speaker is Ms. Han Tang, and she is the founder of Crypto C and the CDAO. Ms. Tang, you may start whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. I'm Tang Han, the founder of Crypto C and CDAO. Um, CDAO is one of the largest uh, DAO community in China. Crypto C is one of the largest uh, ensuing community in China. So today I want to share, talk about the NFT and cultural financialization, um, which is the, my latest thinking about the NFT field. The main content I want to talk about today is um, first we have a quick review about the cost market before NFT and then um, what changes NFT brought to cultural market. Then we will analyze the cultural financialization in detail that allows what we should do now. So let's have a quick review about uh, cultural market before NFT. Um, just think about before the NFT came to the world, how do you, um, how do the cultural uh, market runs? Uh, first, people create cultural concepts. For example, they will write a story or they will uh, create an, a cultural uh, image um, uh, and then they spread this kind of concept to, um, to the world, and then they transform them into cultural commodities. Um, actually, there are two kinds of um, cultural commodities, physical cultural commodities and the virtual uh, cultural commodities. For example, you will buy t-shirts with um, movie stars and you know, uh, political stars, and even with the political slogan, um, you will buy um, tables, the Japanese diet tables are always expensive than the ordinary tables because they um, are having some cultural concept inside. Um, and you will uh, buy some movie tickets and then you go to the cinema and watch movies. Uh, you are also all, all, also pay for a TV series and watch animation and you will like some images and even pay for the um it's like the 
curative things. And um, all these actions we can um, uh, we can uh, say like you are a consumer in this um, in this market. You are a consumer, um, and there are some uh, big invest. There are some big uh, company that are doing investment. So just to look at the uh, uh, things we are consuming now. By the way, um, before the at the past the world, the cultural um, commodity production has just finished its industrialization. The production of IP is gradually combined with the content uh, industry pipeline, such as movie. Uh, it's very, very um, common to see a movie uh, just uh, has like 10,000 people work for a movie and um, it's a very few work to do uh, and it's not the um, same as like a, a 100 years ago um, and the content production lines and the distribution channels and the hands of giants it's very easy to um, um, it's very easy to know that um, when the um, IT industry become a very huge word, its cost is very huge too. And who can accept the risk um, of the IP investment? The giants, and especially the giants who are who has distribution channels. So the internet giants in this um. In past years, they have a very, very huge um, um, speech right in this um, in this field. And the original editor of the IP is in a very weak position because, yes, they may have their IP that once the um, giants, especially the internet giants, they don't like their IP or they don't develop the IP. Um, it's very hard to um, spread it and to um, earn their profit. And the last IP is a long cycle from first to the market. Yeah, maybe um, uh, you write a very exciting story and it takes time for the story to spread and to be discovered by the um, investment organization and um, and they developed by the very huge, very heavy um, content production lines. And that was the, um, maybe taken like uh, 10 years or even longer. So, what has the app changed? First, from the technology side, um, and to just give the work a very unique identity with hash value. And um, by using NFT, we just establish a, a 24 hour cross border trading market. Um, you know, the open sea is very, very expensive now because um, it's the uh, new Amazon today, uh, new Amazon in the virtual world. And it's a 24 hour cross border trading. Um, and then we establish a uh, extremely convenient secondary trans transaction royalty. It has a very, very huge trash to the um, creators um, before NFT comes to the world. Uh, it's, very hard, it's very hard to imagine that we can still, uh, the creator can still be paid when the work has come to the market. And it changed people's um, idea about their uh, copyright. And at last, uh, yeah, you can see a lot of um, sixty zero work uh, comes today. And at last, it gives clients the uh, credentials to participate in community IP governance. We have an NFT, it's not just a commodity. Um, for example, you buy a movie ticket and you watch a movie, it can prove that you are fans of the movie, but you cannot use your movie tickets to govern the, how the IP runs um, in the next state. 
It's very hard to imagine. And you cannot sell your tickets in the 24-hour cross-border trading market. Um, and you can even see your um, tickets become more expensive after consuming. Our app do did that. And from the creator side, uh, issue LFT directly ignoring the content industry assembly line. Um, and as the creators of IP, the right to speak is um, transcend. You know, they can just cross the line and um, issue LFT directly. As for fines, fines can participate in the early um, in the early in uh, incubation and investment of IP. And fans are not only consumers of IP, but also invest and builders of IP. Um, so as far as uh, the content, you can, um, when you have a very good taste uh, of your content or you are very creative ones uh, for good IP, you can earn a lot. And people get a return. So people get a return on investment from hobbies. And also, also Autistics. As for the community, Abby has changed um, from being able to create creators or companies from to being jointly owned by the community. You can see a lot of um, decentralized IBs in uh, the market, such as BLIC and the BP. Um, especially with SDK, they have a slogan. They are born from the um, market. And they were owned by the. Uh, they are they are born from the community and they are owned by the community. And they are last of their um, their goal is, is always to the community. Uh, and the quality on uh, the quality of community members can determine the development potential of IP. It's it's very hard to imagine. Um, uh, so um. Uh, before MT comes to the world, um, how the IBC can be developed and uh, whether it has in the future are um, so um, yes, we will have a very crazy a group of crazy fans especially when they have money is better. But the controlling so uh, who can control it is the company is the um, money now the quality of community members can say it when you have a very good quality of community members they, they are more um uh like to uh hold the nft and they want to contribute to the ibc they will spread it and they will um do um recreate your ibc will be better and you your ip will have a large um, uh, we have a large influence on the market. You know, the uh, common members are not just consumer, but all also your um, your investors and all, and even your staff. Um, so they are also the owners of IP. So the quality of your um, community members is very very um, important. And at last, the NFT token and the development of DAO governance tools make decentralized IP become a way. Um, so before it becomes, uh, you know, the Hollywood and Netflix, um, there are very giants in this market and they can decide a lot of things. But now the community can decide it. And it's a time for um, the creators to speak a lot now. So let's talk about cultural financialization. I think you might notice some uh, interesting uh, phenomenon. Instead of calling it is a commodity, you can call it's better to call it an asset. Yeah, the reason for uh, if the soft bonds to go into the empty market to buy uh, is mainly due to the appreciation of investment rather than the consumption. Why people are very crazy about NFT in all, all 
know the world. Um, because they're doing investment. They're not consuming. You know, the economy is very bad. Um, in China, in America, in Canada, or uh, all over all around the world. They are very bad. The willing for people to consume is very low now. Um, that people want to earn money. They want to see their assets to just go up. So they want to invest in the piece. And uh, you can see the sector rotation in the end market similar, similar to the stock market. And CAD NFT pro projects like BOIC need to keep plan to issue tokens. So you can not see that he has a cultural access, and you can see a very, very um, clear, uh, very, very obvious um, trend. Um, it's like actual monetization. So when community culture is built to um, certain extent, token can be issued under the community consensus and cultural monetization is the ultimate way for the cultural industry to capture the most value. Let's have a couple of uh, reasons of cultural industrialization and the cultural financialization. So from the fan side, they are changing from buying goods to buying assets. From the IP owner side, um, they're changing from selling goods to issuing assets, just like issuing stocks and uh and issue tokens. Um it's a very great change. So you can see a very higher appreciation to the um IP holder or to the cultural market. Before the NFT comes, they are very weak. And after NFT comes, they are very strong. It's not, there's no good market, uh, asset market. And for the industry chain, chain the industrial assembly line of the content production has changed from a strong position to weak position. The financial hype of industry chain is incredibly developed. Um, in China, um, we can see the Tencent are very, very a uh, large um, content giant that they uh, behave badly in this um, in in this round because they are not they, they don't have the um, they don't control the financial hub industry open sea controls it so we are just at a game that will involve all cultural um, Fractionary, um, workers at the cultural industry who have entered in the NFT field will try to get stuck in the ecological position, and those who have no have not entered will enter quickly to in the next two years. And cultural financialization will accelerate of strong cultures to harvest. Weak catchers because the catchers have no buying. It's very true. It's very true. The market is a financial market, and from and and the scene will change from the Hollywood style ideological penetration to our all around financial penetration and capitalism use uses NFT to clear cultural barriers between the nation states. You can see it's um it's a very global market. And the cultural workers who are insisting to uh, spreading to spread their um, own nation culture, um, usually they will have not so good buying because they can cannot uh, get uh, other nations um, money. And the biggest work in the twenty first century is cultural growth, and the most profitable cultural business in the twenty first century. Mm -hmm. Is a cultural business. So what should we do? At first, you should enter the bubble field before others, and profit projects with uh, cross cross cultural backgrounds are more likely to succeed. Um, build. Uh, you can see that the pure white or the um, the pure Chinese 
uh, are not that good that uh, uh, and then you should and then we should build projects that have a uh, cultural reach and depth you know the uh, degree of cultural spread determines the degree to which projects can obtain consensus in the short term and the depth of uh, cultural determines the degree of sustainable operation of the project mm. I like that one to give you um, an advice. Um, before NFT comes to the world, um, people will also do some investment according to the, um, it's like um, the um, financial, financial advisor um, um, opinion. And, but it's very hard for people to learn the financial um, theory and the, it's very hard for them to figure out how the numbers change and why they will do this investment. However, NFT give a um, very, very easy to investment. You can only be with yourself and you should only be with your surprise. Um, when you are um, improve your uh, taste and when you are becoming a better, a better man, a woman, you have a better chance to uh, get richer. Um, I think um, this is the most lovely thing that I um, have seen in the past years, and I wish you all can catch up with this um, big, this huge time. So uh, thanks for your listening. Uh, Thank you for your time, Ms. Tom. And here, I guess, is the end of today's session. Um, if you still have questions, please feel free to join our Telegram group and we will post the assigned team roster for individuals today as well. So if you have any concerns, please go ahead and ask. And make sure you know that the deadline to sign up is today and the March 4th is your project submitting day. Also, a quick reminder for tomorrow's schedule, we will have topics related to blockchain games and metaverse. It will be fun, so make sure you don't miss it. Again, thank you everyone for today. And the lectures are really amazing. We'll see you guys tomorrow. You guys have a wonderful night. Bye-bye.